Hey guys, this is Jules. And this is Andrew. Welcome back to Code School. Today we are going to be talking about game states. Game states? What does that have to do with learning Pi game? I'm so glad you asked, Andrew. What do game states have to do with learning Pi game? Absolutely nothing. Yep, that's right, nothing. Uh, Jules? Have you forgotten why we're here? I thought the point of this tutorial series was to teach Pi game. Well, let me try to explain what I'm attempting here. Okay, so I think it's fairly safe to assume that anyone that is interested in learning Pi game is probably interested in making games, too. Okay, I'm with you so far. And part of learning to code games is learning to structure them so that it ultimately makes coding easier, not to mention debugging and even later when modifications are needed. And when anyone, including you, tries to understand your code, or change it, they will appreciate that you took the time to structure it so well. And don't forget, Jules, organizing your code with a game state is something Scott suggested in his last video, so it must be the best approach. Exactly. But he didn't really go over how to do that, and I'm worried that some of us might not be too sure of how to go about actually doing that, or what it even means. So I thought it would probably be a good idea, before we jump too far into Pi game, to make sure we understand how we should start to think about games in general. Okay, I'm sold. Let's do this. Great! But one thing I need you to do is go put this on. It will help me demonstrate something really important. Sure thing. Be right back. Fortunately, I have superpowers and can change into mine instantly. Uh, Jules? What are you planning to demonstrate later? Are you sure this is absolutely necessary? Oh, come on, Andrew. Just trust me. While he's getting changed, let's talk about what a game state is. It will probably be easiest to understand if we first define what a game is. After all, there are tons of different types of games, and possibly some disagreement about what is a game and what isn't. For our purposes, a game is anything that has the following four things. At least one player, at least one challenge, at least one display, and at least one input method or controller. Jules, what does this have to do with game states? You'll see. Nice dress. Okay, so back to games. The way we know we are playing a game is because it starts, progresses, and finally ends. Aha! So you finally admit World of Warcraft is not a game. Well, no. When we say it ends, we just mean that the player stops playing it. Either because they won, they lost, they need to feed their pets before they starve to death, whatever. Anyway, these are specific moments that exist in all games. Some games have lots more moments, but every game has at least these three distinct moments. These are called game states. What we learned in class is that the start state is where you initialize all your variables and call some kind of loop that tells the program to wait and see what happens next, and then react accordingly. In simple GUI, this was built on the draw handler. Once we started a frame, it would automatically call the draw handler 60 times every second. Once this is started, we enter into the game loop state. This part is not over until the game ends, either because the player wins or loses or completes their objective, or just because they stop playing. When that happens, the game state changes to end. This is when the player is signaled that the game is over. They are told the result and often prompted to play a game or exit. As I said earlier, a game can have many more states than these three. But these three are absolutely required when it comes to programming. Not only that, but all the other states can fall neatly into one of these three states. Often the start state is referred to as the front end. This might include an introduction, a splash screen or tutorial, information about licenses, a main menu, or even a short movie explaining important plot points. The game state can include an introductory movie, different levels or other progression points, time effects where game time and real time aren't the same, like with bullet time or pause states, and also saving or loading screens to entertain the player while the hard stuff is happening. Finally, the end state can include an end game movie, credits, and it is actually responsible for making sure files and networks are closed appropriately when the player quits the game. Jules, 
are we to the demonstration part yet? Because I'm starting to feel a little self-conscious here. Not quite, but almost. Just a little bit longer. If it makes you feel any better, I'm sure everyone watching appreciates your sacrifice. I'll distract you. Let's talk about food. Food? Shouldn't we get back to explaining game states? Absolutely. So yeah, let's consider making dinner. There are lots of states involved. Shopping, preparing the ingredients, reading the recipe, cooking, eating, and cleaning. Notice that each of these events are separate from the others, but you can go back and forth between various events. You might go from preparing to cleaning, then back to preparing, for example. We call these state transitions, but you don't have to remember that for now. The circles are states. The arrows are actions that cause a state change. Here we see that the cooking process starts in the start state. We start there. That is the current state. From there, there is only one action, read recipe. Performing this action transitions us into the reading state. When the current state is the reading state, we have several actions available. We can take the action follow the recipe, which moves us to the cooking state, or we can make a list and go to the store, which moves us to the shopping state. The diagram makes clear which state transitions are legal. For instance, according to the diagram, it is not possible to transition directly from reading to eating. Notice it's possible to transition from one state to another and back again. For example, we can transition from reading to cooking and back to reading. Also notice that the same action can cause a different state transition, depending on the current state. For example, from the cooking state, if we do the measure chop action, we transition to preparing, whereas from the cleaning state, the measure chop action also transitions to preparing. When we use this kind of separation in our games, it actually makes our coding much more logical and simple. Everything that can happen or must happen within one state gets wrapped up together. Then in order to leave that state, some type of transition must occur. Here's a short little game to demonstrate. It starts with this screen and this button. Until a transition event occurs, it will stay on this screen. When I push the button, that triggers a transition between the start state and the gameplay state. Now it will stay in this state until something triggers another transition. If we look at the code for this, we can see that all of our states are separate classes. There is one for start, one for game, and one for end. Our start state just creates a frame and draws the appropriate stuff. It also registers a button and waits to handle the button press event. But notice, when the button is pressed and the start state is active, this triggers a transition to the gameplay state. Now, the gameplay state takes over and draws the stuff on the screen. Now it waits to handle the button press event. If we look closely at all our states, we can see that they all have several things in common. They are initialized almost exactly the same. Their draw methods are exactly the same. Only a few small details are different. We don't want to repeat ourselves if we can help it. Plus, we don't want to have to do all this work over and over again if we end up making a game with a hundred states. This is where inheritance comes in. We can make a parent class that has all the basic elements that will be common to all states. Then we create the individual state classes and make each one inherit from the parent class. To do this in Python, we create each class as normal. And then, between the class name and the colon, we put the name of the parent class in parentheses. In our game, we don't necessarily need to use the parent class. Instead, we use the child classes like normal. The child class automatically inherits all the stuff we put in the parent class, meaning it has access to all the same methods and data elements defined in the parent. So if it's exactly the way it should be, I don't have to do anything. If I want to overwrite something in the parent class, I just put the new information in the child class. And if I want more methods that aren't in the parent class, I can just add them as usual to the child class. Inheritance is a great tool to allow us to express certain kinds of relationships between objects. Using inheritance, we can form logical structure in our code that clearly expresses the intent of the application, while allowing for extensibility and code reuse. 
Okay, Andrew, are you ready to find out why you're wearing that? Absolutely. Well, when I was thinking about game states, I started thinking about some of my favorite games. I tried to identify each transition point, and I realized after going over tons of games that one particular plot setup kept coming up. Hero is happy, all is well, bad guy comes along and messes up things, and the hero has to set things right. This kind of plot is usually provided in the front end of games, and then gameplay begins with the hero starting to solve the problem. Yeah, that's definitely a common theme, but I still don't get what that has to do with how I'm dressed. Have no fear, I'll save you. My hero. Thanks for watching, guys. And if you like this tutorial, please remember to subscribe and click the like button.